The control of movement and view in the work of Le Corbusier produces an almost cinematic representation. It's, it's this dynamic spatiality that in some ways supersedes the one-point perspectival calibrations and mathematical stability of Brunelleschi or Alberti. The account of Le Corbusier then is a good transition to the final set of modules in this course. Here we'll deal more directly with architecture's relationship to its various social and historical context, and we'll account for what we've been calling architecture's power of representation. We've already seen this power at work. In fact, the first set of modules developed the two fundamental prerequisites for representation, form and history. And then in our second set of modules, we added to that materiality. And with these three prerequisites, we can recall Hegel's great argument that with these techniques or devices, architecture is called upon to do nothing less than represent the truth of its historical context. But representation can mean other things as well. It can mean that architecture sometimes performs like a linguistic metaphor. In the upcoming module, we'll look at the visionary architects of the 18th century and their use of architecture as a way of speaking uh, to communicate meaning, what they call l'architecture parlant, or speaking architecture. One of the exercises in another module asks you to list some of the dozens of metaphors used by a critic to characterize an architectural project. Representation can also point to the mnemonic function of architecture, that is, its power to carry memories that are historical and contextual, its power to carry collective memories. But in general, Representation means that architecture performs like a cognitive map of society. It gives us a rational diagram of society's deep, complex structures. It gives shape to an epoch's particular character and nature. And it links the memory of pasts to possible futures.